afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our IATL hybrid conference, to uh, one of the last sessions of the conference. I'm Donna Bourne Tyson. I'm the Dean of Libraries at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, this is a session on workplace and organizational culture. We have three presentations for you. Uh, they are all online. I'll introduce each uh, set of presenters as they begin and we'll hold the questions until the end. Those of you online can put your questions in the chat in feed loop and we'll have uh, somebody here read the questions out for you. So our first presentation is two speakers from the USA, Lauren Fralinger and Shatha Beydoun from the University of Miami. The title of their presentation is Community Outreach and Engagement in a Time of Crisis, the Peer Research Consultants Program. Lauren is the Education and Arts and Science Librarian at the University of Miami Libraries. She serves as liaison to the School of Education and Human Development and the Departments of Sociology, Anthropology, Philosophy, and Gender and Sexuality Studies. She is the Program Manager for the Peer Research Consultants Program and the co-lead for the Library Research Scholars Program, providing opportunities for undergraduate students to complete a year-long research project under the mentorship of a librarian. Her areas of focus include censorship, mentorship, instruction, and diversity initiatives. Shatha or Shatha Beydoun, my apologies, is the History and Modern Languages and Literatures Librarian at the University of Miami Libraries. She is a library faculty member at the University of Miami. She has a master's degree in information science from Wayne State, along with a master's degree in history from the University of Michigan. Her current research interests include academic libraries, information literacy, DEIA issues, along with the various ways libraries, museums, and archives design metadata for Arabic and Islamic cultural artifacts. So uh, let's give a virtual welcome to our speakers. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Freilinger and I am the Education and Arts and Sciences Librarian here at the University of Miami Libraries. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as cisgender and able-bodied. And my name is Shazza Bidoun. I ident identify as cisgender, able-bodied, and middle class person who I'd also identifies as Middle Eastern. At the University of Miami, I serve the departments of history, modern languages, and literatures. Thank you for joining us today. We're here today to tell you about the Peer Research Consultants Program at the University of Miami Libraries and how that program changed and adapted following the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020. First off, what is the Peer Research Consultants Program? Why do we have it? How does it align with UM Libraries goals? As part of its mission to provide the university community access to collections, information services, learning support and digital expertise, the University of Miami Libraries built a learning commons in the first floor of the Richter Library, which opened in 2017. The mission of the learning commons is to offer opportunities for students to work individually and collaboratively and to learn from both peers and experts. The peer research consultants are a key component in completing this mission. As a peer-to-peer -peer research consultation service, the Peer Research Consultant Program modernizes and replaces the traditional reference desk model with one where the peer research consultants, usually shortened to PRCs or peer consultants, help students with basic research needs. Comprised of a combination of seven undergraduate and graduate students from wide-ranging wide majors, PRCs relate to the needs of the student population. One of their greatest strengths is that they have taken many of the same courses other students have taken and can relate and advise on best practices for search strategies and finding appropriate scholarly resources. While working, peer research consultants staff the research help desk, which is co-located in the Richter Library's Learning Commons with, partner, uh, with campus partner groups that support student learning, including the Writing Center, Academic Technologies, the Kamner Center for Academic Tutoring, and the Modern Languages Lab. Though peer consultants lack the depth of disciplinary knowledge a subject librarian possesses, they serve as an initial layer of research assistance, trained and capable of aiding their peers in finding books and articles, navigating databases, and developing search strategies. 
The fact that they're students themselves often makes them more approachable and relatable to other students, helping create a sense of comfort and familiarity among the student population when using the library. So what was it like before COVID? The Peer Research Consultants Program was conceptualized as a consultation service that would replace the traditional reference desk model. In more recent years, questions have shifted from complex research questions requiring a librarian's expertise to either simple directional or quick reference questions, which a trained students can answer. Instead of a team of librarians and staff answering these questions, PRCs now form an initial layer of contact with students seeking assistance. They're trained to assist with basic level research questions, such as utilizing the library catalog and creating search strategies for databases. They're also taught how to make appropriate referrals to subject librarians for more complex questions or direct patrons to other learning commons partners, depending on patron needs. As the program manager for the Peer Research Consultants Program, I design and manage the program as a whole and act as supervisor for the Peer Research and Learning Coordinator and the Peer Consultants. While I'm responsible for directing the program, I supervise and collaborate with the Peer Research and Learning Coordinator who oversees the direct supervision of the Peer Consultants. The Peer Research and Learning Coordinator is a staff position that works directly with both the program manager, me, and the Peer Consultants. Working as a team, Peer Research Consultants, the Peer Research and Learning Coordinator, and the program manager provide a comprehensive consultation service to patrons of the University of Miami Libraries. Situated at the service point in the Learning Commons, we are a highly visible service integrated into a larger ecosystem of research support and a key component of the Learning Commons mission. Then everything changed when COVID began. March of 2020 hit everyone, everywhere, very hard, all at once, and necessitated an incredibly rapid change in teaching, learning, and the provision of services. The Peer Research Consultants Program was not unaffected. On March 13th, 2020, the University of Miami, along with most other academic institutions across the United States, went into quarantine as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic spreading across the country. During this time, there was a massive shift from in-person classes to online learning campus-wide. This shift included the peer research consultants. When classes resumed on March 23rd, the peer consultants also resumed work virtually, focusing research support services through the UM Libraries Ask a Librarian chat service. Scattered across Florida and across the rest of the United States, peer consultants provided virtual research support services from as far away as Texas and Ohio. Instead of sitting in Richter Library's learning commons, peer consultants worked from kitchen counters, dining room tables, and lab desks on their personal computers, providing uninterrupted service to students at the University of Miami at a time when there was an enormous need for information, not only leading into final exams, but simply regarding the sweeping changes happening at the university. Regular hours were expanded to meet additional demand and the peer consultants took on additional hours to provide needed coverage during the crisis. I was very fortunate to have Shaza step up to help me run the peer research consultants program at this point in time, as we lost our peer research and learning coordinator, thankfully not to COVID, but to another job. We divided his responsibilities between us. Shaza took on scheduling and time cards, while I handled the overall supervision and training. The closing of physical spaces at the library dramatically changed the context of reference work. The peer research consultants were previously situated in a focal point in the learning commons, which made it easy for patrons to find us and ask for assistance. With the library closed, we became the Ask a Librarian link in the upper right corner of the UM Libraries website. While the need for assistance at the beginning of the pandemic was acute and drove a massive influx of questions, classes ended for the summer in 2020 and stretched into the fall, we saw a decline in questions coming in. The information ecosystem of the learning commons was disrupted and the network of partners disjointed, making it harder for learning commons partners to refer patrons to us and for new students to learn about our services. While we've seen a return to pre-pandemic levels of questions and behavior patterns now that we're back in person in the learning commons, this change during the pandemic caused us to reconsider services beyond basic reference as a, part of the re as a part of the peer research consultants program. How could the peer research consultants still help the University of Miami community? What were our patrons needs given the new environment and changed circumstances? The 
pandemic was not the only crisis in the United States at this time either. Protests for racial justice spread across the country rapidly in the wake of George Floyd's death in, the May, in, in May of 2020. To help meet information needs related to these issues, peer research consultants were integrated into pandemic-driven initiatives, such as creating the Racial Justice and K-12 Pandemic Resources Guides, with the goals of engaging virtually with our community and combating misinformation. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Shaza to tell you more specifically about these initiatives. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so the shift to online services gave uh, PRCs the opportunity to collaborate with UM libraries, faculty and staff in new ways and in new outreach programs and community initiatives. But before talking about these, I would like to situate the PRC program within the larger context of academic libraries and outreach programs. According to Kelly and others in 2015, peer-to-peer -peer learning in academic libraries is an old concept that dates back to the 1970s when California State University professional librarians with student assistance at the reference desk to answer directional and simple reference questions. And since then, the program has been called different things in different campuses, both nationally and internationally, including Peer Assisted Learning, or PAL, or Library PAL Consultants, LPCs, or Student Peer Research Consultants, SPRC. However, the objective of the Peer Research Consultant Program remains clear, and I turn once again to Kelly, who offers a descriptive uh, analogy of a safe harbor, whereby students can, and I quote, manage their own learning experiencing experiences by exploring, practicing, and questioning their understanding of issues and topics the well-trained peer untethered from a hierarchical a hierarchy inherent in formal instruction environments or in working with professional librarians, librarians and staff, end quote. More importantly, and since it is inception as a library service, the PRC's main objective has and continues to be empowering students with the necessary information literacy skills needed for student success, both academically and personally. Next slide, please. Within the context of the University of Miami libraries, Lauren has given you the historical trajectory of the program, and I want to highlight the specificities of the program by sharing with you a screenshot of the program as it appears on the library web website. Um, the URL link, if I can, I'm gonna to try to post that in the chat. Okay, um, I have posted the link. And the simple objective of the PRC is to help students with one, developing search strategies, two, finding scholarly resources, three, creating and managing citations, and four, facilitate, facilitating meetings with other learning commons experts. Lauren has already told you about this. Notice that community outreach and engagement are understood to be implicit rather than explicit objectives of the program. Next slide, please. The first initiative of the PRCs, or the first initiative that the PRC worked on was the creation of the K-12 Reading Room Resource Guide. Created at the very beginning of the pandemic, the K-12 Guide was specifically designed to provide UM staff, faculty, and their families with information on the pandemic, along with links to activities to occupy themselves during the initial lockdown. Peer consultants, in collaboration with librarians, brought together resources on COVID-19, mental health, and family activities ranging from watching animal cam cameras at zoos to art and physical fitness. Next slide, please. With the socio-political and medical crisis looming during the summer of 2020, we decided that our students, both PRCs and those seeking research, uh, research help, needed support and access to information. The impetus to create the Racial Justice Guide was organic and involved the director of the Learning Commons along with the supervisor of the Learning and Research Services together with subject specialists and liaison librarians. When the call was put out to the PRCs to aggregate links for the Racial Justice, Racial Justice Guide, we could tell that they were really excited to be part of it. Ideas about potential tabs were solicited and wanted to target both and non-academic audiences, we chose to highlight resources such as fiction titles, nonfiction, along with library titles in our juvenile collection. 
In addition, as you can see from the tab here, from the screenshot here, the guide also highlights UML special and archival collections for the UM academic community. Next slide, please. In fact, one of our bilingual PRC suggested adding a Spanish resource tab highlighted here. We thought this was a great idea because it spoke to the University of Miami and the city of Miami being the gateway to the Americas. Just like the English portion of the racial justice guide, the Spanish section included fiction, nonfiction, and audiovisual materials all in the Spanish language. Next slide, uh, please. Since its creation, the Racial Justice Guide has been viewed a, a total of 2,080 times. And I present here the breakdown of the analytics. In addition, it has been featured in multiple campus events, including the university's newsletter known as News at the U. The creation of the guide was also part of a wave of racial justice initiatives in 2020 to 2021 that took place campus-wide at the University of Miami and included the creation of the Center for Global Black Studies. Next slide, please. Additionally, the major objective of the PRC program is to give students information literacy skills. Given the socio-political environment of 2020 and 2021, the need to impart information literacy skills became even more pressing. Working closely with the PRCs, we decided to expand one of our pre-existing guides, the News and Newspapers Guide, to address the growing problems with misinformation in the media. So we added a new tab focusing on identifying media bias and vetting media sources, which is truly, um, or which truly speaks to the objective of the PRC program and its mission to impart information literacy skills. Next slide, please. Indeed, coordinating seven student workers during an international pandemic and giving them additional training on media bias and finding reliable resources during a time of rapid change and misinformation was challenging. Prior to the pandemic, PRCs at, at, UML, at UML or UM libraries were not typically involved in the creation and development of research guides. While the peer consultants do free up time for the majority of librarians in the learning and research services di uh, department, coordinating their work virtually during a global pandemic was very time intensive for both Lauren and I. Though at times challenging, it was also a very empowering experience for both librarians and PRCs. It also gave PRCs the opportunity to be involved in new community outreach program during a time of rapid change. Their contributions will have a lasting, lasting impact on anyone utilizing the guides in the future. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is our next slide, please, Lauren. Um, this is our list of references, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Lauren and Shaza, for that inspiring presentation. Uh, next, we're moving on to a presentation from Botswana, Ayanda Labelle and Galafet Wadula from the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. We'll be talking about a marriage and community of people, workflows and practices, how COVID-19 pandemic propelled a blending of interlibrary loans and reference desk services at the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. Ayanda is the Director of Library Services and Galifet Leswadula is the Interlibrary Loan Library Officer at the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. Over to our colleagues from Botswana. As I've been introduced, my name is Khalifete Leswadula. I'm with my corporate Presenter Ayanda Lebele. I am representing to you from Botswana uh, in a University of Science and Technology. Uh, our title is A Marriage in Community of People, Workflows and Practices How COVID 19 Pandemic Propelled a Blending of Inter Library Loans and Reference Desk Services at the Botswana International. University of Science and Technology used. Our presentation outline, I'll start by contextualizing these 
Library in Botswana International University of Science and Technology. BUST is a public STEM university, which is situated in Palape, the central, which is in the central of Botswana. It has started operate since 2004. It started to operate in 2004 full time. And the construction of BUST uh, began in 2009 under the Botswana International University and Technology Act of 2005. BUST is a public university uh, which started in 2004, as I mentioned which was developed or constructed by Botswana in a mission to develop or promote science and technology. The government of Botswana recognizes the role of STEM in diversifying the economy, improving productivity, increasing national competitiveness and improving the standards of living. The BUSD has a full-time enrollment of 2,000, of 2000 students and about 470 staff complement. The library staff has three functions with 18 staff. Uh, it is divided into two sections, as I said, the admin, the information support, and resource management. Here, this is the context of views library. I will be presenting to you the high-level initiatives related to information support. The first one is to deliver the response library services for academic excellence and build a high performing team. As the reference and, inform and international library services falls under information support services, here are the services that are provided in the information support services. The reference desk, interlibrary loan services, user registration, orientation, faculty liaison, ILS instructional services, collection building and sharing, and serving as the needed conduit with all types of stakeholders. This we adopted or we used a critical reality to collect the data, uh, which is explorative, descriptive with intent of service improvement. We run or we had uh, in 2021 uh, uh, the surveys which yielded poor response. Therefore, our case was based on the response that we got from the surveys in 2021. I have instructions or the leading questions that will be presenting to you. The first one is, how did Buse Library blend ILL and the reference desk services into a context-specific online document delivery service? And how does the repurpose document delivery service fit into the global post-COVID-19 pandemic teaching and learning. Also, we'll be talking about how can use library staff and users be enabled to sustain the newly developed, predominantly nest-based learning, learning services. Lastly, we'll be talking about what learning insights can be used to inform advocacy for strengthened library gatekeeping and licensing systems for effective sharing of information for continued 
research and scholarship during emergencies. I'll give it to my co-presenter to take you through our case. Thank you, Mr. Deswajula. Good greetings, or good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, where you are. I am Ayanda Libele. I'll continue with the actual case that we want to share with you and start with how does the repurposed document delivery system fit into or oh, how did the BUST library uh, merge the services? That's the first part. Uh, the reference and uh, the interlibrary loans librarians um, became at the forefront of the disaster management strategy. And may I highlight that at that point, we did not have a disaster management strategy, uh, but we had the, these two service uh, providers acting as ensuring that there was no access to the red tape to print collection. They were ensuring that uh, those who walked into the library ad 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 adhered to all the COVID protocols. Apologies, I must have skipped a slide. Yes, apologies. Um, let me start by saying the services, they encroached into the what used to be the traditional collection development activities. So the interlibrary loans librarian and the reference librarians, and like my colleague mentioned, we are only 18 in our small library. So there are only two people who are critical to these services. So they merged into one. That's why we, that's why we say it's a marriage of services. They merged into one and their service evolved into um, seemingly collection development librarians now. They switched from pay to read resources through the subscribed databases to now being hunters and gatherers in open access platforms. They also merged and became more of liaison with information service providers because they are the ones who directed the, the vendors, the information vendors on what our users needed and how to enable our users for virtual access. We also saw these two key librarians now being very active in the intranet and also sharing information in, uh, in the internet. For example, they were now serving as the library marketing services, plus also becoming the systems librarians in some cases. We also saw them being very, very active in the Ask Librarian. They became institutional community conduits, um, communication conduits both information from the users, from the staff, and the, from the information vendors. They were our line of survival. They also supported in users' personal information development, social support, e.g. they helped people in managing fear, they helped in say, disseminating information on COVID information, and even guide on non-library related services. Now the slide that I had jumped into uh, when we started. They became the disaster management uh, experts. They also became very active in digital optimization of all other library services, which initially were done in person. For example, they were very active in online user registration. They also had to make sure that the user guides were available. Of course, the back uh, officers were doing work, but they were the front people who kept on ushering the information to the users. They were also involved in instant short cataloging. Like I said, they would, they were more like our hunter gatherers in the open access. So they would quickly create a short uh, catalog record for the users to access, to, for make, to make the content discoverable. They dealt with uh, instant messages and document delivery. These are the people also who were in the forefront when they were imparting research skills. Quick ones, and then where the user needed in depth uh, guidance, then they would refer to any other subject librarian or other librarian that was responsible. So they played a very key role. Their lines became so undefined. They dealt with researchers requested as they requested for support services, for example, citation indices, research management tools, 
the student learning and resources, which was such a difficult thing because not all textbooks were available uh, and not all readers could had the digital skills. So they were our lifeline, if I may say. Uh, furthermore, the lectures needed uh, support on learning management systems. And these people were our go-to, they were our reference point in almost all the things that were needed by our community of users together with what was needed by us as librarians. And, and, and we also, while they were on the ground, they had to develop new uh, service level agreements, turnaround times that were quicker. And we kind of got all the directives from them or through them. Um, now, the other question we wanted to look at was, how does the repurposed delivery service fit into the global uh, uh, system? We learned that we were not the only people who were struggling and that gave a lot of consolation and we could easily benchmark with our colleagues in the networks, in the associations, both locally and internationally. And we also read in the literature to realize that there were those who were in the upper margin and those, so we were not just in the outliers. Like we learned that while China was able to, uh, even during the lockdown, they were able to continue with their full-time services. Countries like Italy were, were, were struggling with other services. So when we were struggling with other services, we realized that we were not way too far. We realized that the shutdown of the library building did not translate into the shutdown of library services globally. So it was, it was consoling for us to see where we were struggling. And then uh, we also observed that our ILL immediately switched from strict, um, uh, 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 it switched to strict electronic document delivery. We started using WhatsApp, we started using messengers, features that were not uh, earlier on part of the ILL. It was predominantly through email. So we now changed the mode. And like I say, it was the ILL officer and the reference librarian who were key to this. We also realized that there was a thin line between the private and official space. We started getting requests even at night. We started forwarding requests to our users at night. At the odd hours that we are usually not library times. We started encroaching into people's personal phone numbers. We started using private emails because due to the digital divide, not everybody had access to the institutional email or the gadgets that were officially registered. So we observed all time, always learning from ourselves as fellow librarians, we had to keep learning from each other so that the next morning we are ready. We learn from our ILL partners. We learn from users too. We also learn from user service, the, the service providers. They trained us in interactive user engagement solutions. What are the challenges? Many, many, many. Key to that were the cultural, organizational and cultural barriers. Uh, the general prejudice of, or the conservative view of online learning and online library services as secondary. People wanted primary access to the library, but we couldn't offer that. And the stereotypes of library in learning not all were ready to take us along in their new learning mode. We also were limited by the technical uh, limitations and the devices for information access and information sharing, the typical challenges of the digital divide. And not everybody was well-skilled in, in accessing the collection remotely. And we also had copyright limitations. That was the worst limitation that we had and lack of supportive legislation and policies. And then we also had undefined or not tested uh, mo or monitoring processes for both the users and the staff supervision. And there was a lot of potential risks in, in, the, in, the, in the process. We also had limited digitized learning content. But with all these challenges, we realized that like one of our, our question here was, are we our challenges or our successes remotely removed from other people in the group, we realized that we were kind of in the same package with many other people. We also had a challenge of limited funds. We, I will combine the research question three, what we call a research question three and the research guide, let me say, our case study guide number four, the what are the learning insights and how can we sustain that? 
we, we realized that um, the library needs a digital transform transformation strategy for the new paradigm. We didn't have a transformation strategy. We really need that. Um, we, we also have youth structure has provision for digital scholarship librarians. In the new organizational structure, we have requested for a provision for a digital scholarship librarian, and we have been granted that. So we are working towards having both a strategy and people to drive it. We have realized the need for transformation processes, a business model and organizational culture. We need to enhance access to internet. Uh, we are really in an information era and the, 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 the advent of COVID has really made us realize that we need more access and technologies than we need more books at the moment in our context. There was more demand for computers and for internet at the library and we realized we are pushing towards that. We realized that we need to enhance our online user education classes, both for our users and we need capacity building programs for our librarians. We also realized that we, uh, we need new strategies for content curation, selection, organization, and presentation of our content. And we need to strengthen our capacity on web technologies, use of different softwares for communication and for sharing information. In that way, then we would be ready for whichever uh, disaster may strike us. We also need to support teaching, learning, and online through teaching learning online through capacity building interventions. And we have seen that also emerging in a lot of literature. We also need institutional policies that support or protect encroachment into that private space that we mentioned. Uh, the late night request, the use of private emails and phones, and we need concerted efforts to, for the institutional management on the procurement of adequate state of the art ICT tools and the training of the people. Um, this is a summary of how we blended that, and these are the insights that we picked on what we needed for us to be able to survive should we have any disaster or should we want to continue being of better service to our users. Thank you. These are our contacts. In case you have a, a question, it would be welcome. Thank you so much, Ayanda and Galafet, for sharing your research findings with us. Extremely useful. Uh, we're going on to our third presentation now, back in the USA. Um, Mira Waller and Carla Lee from the University of Virginia. And the title of their presentation is The F Future of Flexible Work and Hybrid Work Culture Beyond COVID-19 challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned at the University of Virginia libraries. Uh, Mira Waller is the Associate University Librarian for Research and Learning Services. She serves on the library's senior leadership team, providing leadership for the subject liaison program, the teaching and learning program, faculty programs, specialized user services, and information services, and public spaces. Waller also oversees the development of services and programming for new and evolving teaching and research tools and methods, including those for digital scholarship, multimedia production and use, and data management and analysis. Previously, Waller was the department head of research engagement in the Northern Carolina State University Libraries. She has been an active participant in the movement to re-envision the role of the subject liaison both at NC State and nationally, contributing to the development of tools and training to enhance support for research. Before joining the NCSU Libraries, Waller was Director of Publishing Services for Project Euclid, an online community and platform for mathematics and statistics scholarship managed jointly by Cornell University Library and Duke University Press. In a previous life, Waller was also an archivist. Carla Lee is currently the Deputy University Librarian at the University of Virginia Library, where she oversees administration, strategic planning, project management, and facilities. She began working as a science and technology librarian in 1990, where she served as a library associate at the Natural Sciences Library at the University of Michigan. In 1992, she moved to the Science Library at Loyola University, Chicago, where she served in several roles, including reference coordinator, and head of the science library. 
In 2005, she began work at the University of Virginia. Through the course of her career at UVA, Carla has held multiple positions, including digital collections librarian, collection strategist, senior director of collections, access and discovery, and interim head of special collections. So please welcome our final two speakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mira Waller, and this is my colleague, Carla Lee. And um, as uh, mentioned, we're here to talk about the future of flexible work in the hybrid work culture. Um, we're using a case study of the UVA library and talking specifically about some of the challenges, opportunities, and lessons we learned. Um, and we're, we're hopefully sharing a framework that might be useful for others. So um, we just wanted to give just a quick overview of what we'll be covering. And one of the things we wanted to do is define what we meant by hybrid work. We also wanted to break that case study up into a couple of different periods, you know, the pre-COVID, the COVID, all the re-entries that we had, and then finally, you know, in this weird state that we're in right now. Um, and then we wanted to talk about the framework, um, in particular principles and then other considerations. Then we wanted to share some conclusions with you all. So let's begin by talking about what we mean by hybrid work. And while hybrid work has a lot of different variations, it usually involves some kind of flexible work arrangement. And by that we mean a work arrangement that's flexible in terms of where the work happens and when the work happens. The University of Virginia is a research one university in the Carnegie, Carnegie classification system. Partially designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it has been staunchly residential. We have 12 schools and a hospital based in Charlottesville and educate more than 25,000 students. There is a largely decentralized governance structure where much of the work gets done through personal relationship rather than documentation or process. Pre-pandemic, the library already had a dispersed staff among many branch libraries. In January 2020, this was complicated as we began relocating approximately two thirds of our staff to several um, additional locations, some as far as 10 miles away in preparation for our main library renovation. When we began to look for office space, we discussed telework, but the idea met with staff resistance and seemed impossible at the time. At this point, there were university policies on telework, but remote work was rarely used in a sustained manner, more for snow days or occasional mobility issues. COVID changed all of that very quickly. Our preparation for working in dispersed locations paid off as library staff were well-versed in Zoom and other applications as UVA made a rapid shift to online education. At the university level, new pan-university groups were formed to address the changing landscape in as timely a way as possible. One such group, the Operations and Logistics Group, brought together services such as library, housing, student affairs, and parking for the first time. Much of the policy and procedure needed to support rapid change was not in place and administration triaged and made decisions as quickly as possible. One thing to note, over the course of the virtual only instruction period, approximately 25% of the library staff were working on grinds at some point to support online learning and research. So over the past two plus years, we've seen large scale changes at UVA happening almost on a semester by semester basis. And all of this being based on evolving conditions and information around COVID-19. So if we look at that time frame um, of you know, March 2020 through um, the present, um, for UVA, what happened was that in early March 2020, everyone was set home. And I say that everyone was set home sort of in quotes because while all teaching and any research was being done remotely, the reality of the situation as Carly just mentioned was that we still had a, a pretty you know, decent amount, significant amount I would say of essential staff that were working on campus. And over the next several months in that early March, you know, April, May period, additional staff at the library and on grounds at UVA volunteered to come onto campus to help out. And then we had other folks trickling in as there were issues with internet connectivity um, and, and challenges that sometimes couldn't be met um, in an all virtual uh, way. So on this timeline, 
August 16, 2021 was the official date that we had set for library staff to return to campus. However, once again, in reality, we were still tweaking work arrangements past that August 16th date. And from August 2021 through the present, the library did move toward a hybrid arrangement for many staff. But at the same time, we were all more and more supporting a largely residential, albeit if masked and socially distanced, experience with students largely back. And at that same time, while most teaching was still remote in the fall of 2021, by the spring, we had moved to a much more hybrid teaching environment, but many faculty were still teaching. While many faculty were being asked, I should say, to teach in person, we still had a number of faculty who were uncomfortable, um, understandably so, doing that. And so the university then had to put procedures in place where faculty could request accommodations based on need and their, their different evolving situations. During this entire time period um, of the hybrid work environment, when we had rising COVID-19 cases that coupled with hospitalizations, we would fall back to short periods of fully remote teaching and then reassess local conditions, coming back to the hybrid environment when conditions improved. Throughout this period, the library found itself expanding and contracting in-person services and considerations um, about space opening based upon those local COVID-19 conditions in conjunction with the service needs of UVA. We also, both the university and the library, had a lot of considerations um, that were coming at us external to the university. And many of those, in fact, I would say just about all of them were out of our control. So some examples of that were city, state, federal, uh, the Center for Disease Control's policies and procedures. Um, and we just, you know, we had to adapt and be okay with things being out of our control. So um, in terms of what the university did um, in helping create some guidelines, um, we, the university created a future of work group that was designed to research and recommend practices that would support the needs of UVA and its workforce. Um, and they wanted to do this, we wanted to do this in a way that would encompass post pandemic um, workforce arrangements as well. So um, there was a group that was designated that group was focused on the academic division at the University of Virginia, um, leaving aside the medical side. And that future of work group um, issued a report on June 7th, 2021 that supported telework and the way in which they created some guidelines really focused on trusting the schools, departments, university uh, units, et cetera, to determine much of their own specific policies based upon unique needs. However, the report did still emphasize the importance, the importance of supporting a residential learning community at UVA. Based upon those guidelines, the library developed its own plan. And this is where that date for returning to campus on August 16, 2021 came about for the library. Um, the UVA guidelines included things like some classifications for different positions, you know, uh, based upon things like fully remote, fully in person and hybrid work options. And, you know, there weren't any really prescriptive things into put into place, but really just broad categories and recommendations. And then once again, they really trusted those um, individual units, schools, departments, uh, to determine those specific policies uh, for each of their own um, staff and faculty. The library's application of these guidelines focused on making sure that we were basing our policies on positions and not individuals, that we were giving managers authority to determine um, their team and position needs. Once again, passing down as the university um, was trusting uh, individual units, we were trusting managers and staff um, to know what it was that they needed to get done. Um, and then we were trying to extend flexibility whenever possible, given the circumstances. Um, 
And then um, we made sure that we had written agreements in place for anybody who had a regularly scheduled hybrid work uh, arrangement. So this framework that we are sharing with you all now is based upon that experience and the work that we did in the library to establish those guidelines and policies within the overarching principles set by our university. Our first principle was to balance mission and safety. This was, of course, a moving target as CDC recommendations refined, changed, and were translated into UVA policy. Policy doesn't equal staff comfort, however. I'm sure that many of you have had a similar experience. For many staff, nothing felt safe enough. However, we have a clear mission to support the teaching and research of the university, so we rearranged spaces. We brought in masks and air purifiers and did everything we could to promote mask wearing and social distancing, including a policy that if mask compliance in public spaces was too low, we would clear the students from the building and close the um, library for a short period of time. Another principle that we built into our framework is the importance of equity and equity across many dimensions. And big disclaimer here, while we did our best to build this principle into this framework of ours, it's important to acknowledge that we didn't get it right at the beginning. We're still figuring it out and we continue to work in this area. Some of the challenges that we faced in terms of um, looking at equity was that not everyone could be given hybrid work options based upon the job that they were doing and the position. We also knew that having less staff who were in person meant that there would be less staff who'd be available to quickly step in to help those on the front line when there were emergencies or extra coverage was needed. And we also needed to think about things like, what about frontline staff who have outside care needs or health issues or have um, parental or, or childcare needs? And we knew finally that um, inequities already existed in different classifications. So, for instance, if you were faculty or if you were staff, or if you were exempt or non-exempt also meant that in the, in the pre-COVID days, there were also, also already norms and considerations built in around this kind of flexible and hybrid work arrangement. For example, faculty had the arrangement already and non-exempt staff really didn't. So in trying to frame our principle around equity, we also looked at, once again, making sure that we were not focusing on individuals when we were setting uh, whether a position could be um, eligible for hybrid work. But we also tried to extend flexibility when it was possible for individuals due to different extenuating circumstances. We also focused on having managers work very closely with their staff to determine what it was that was really critical and what it was that we could not do for the time being. The library also flip, split hybrid down into um, a more um, granular level. And what we did was that if somebody was working less than 50%, um, on campus or mostly working at, from home, we looked at redistributing um, offices with closed doors or uh, more um, primary spaces uh, for people who had to be uh, working on campus. We had a lot of volunteers also who would come in to relieve people and take desk shifts. And those volunteers included staff from across all units of the library, not just public services. And it also included senior library administrators. We also looked at reconsidering how to measure performance and we looked at making sure that rewards and benefits took into account these different arrangements. Another building block of our framework included the principle of being very clear about roles and responsibilities and making sure that we were capturing these things and that we were making sure that as people's 
positions and the things that they were doing were changing, that we were accurately reflecting that um, in, in what their profile job profiles were, what the positions were that they were doing, um, and making sure that um, they knew that we were aware of the job role changes. From the move online, we knew we had to be flexible. As with many large organizations, this was a bit of a struggle. But when we made that first pivot to online learning, which many in the organization had seen as impossible, we began to gain confidence. We increased communication with staff, including being willing to say that this is our path now, but we may need to change given the environment or as we learn new things. We try to continue to be flexible and focused on assessment as we remain in unprecedented times where user behavior doesn't fall into our formerly predicted patterns. As is often the case, well-defined principles come up against reality. Here are some of the things that we came up against as we applied our framework. Of course, this time has brought its challenges in regard to workplace culture. Much of our effort, particularly in the first six months, in addition to meeting the mission, was to focus on team culture and employee support, particularly for managers. The university provided online training in learning how to manage in a remote environment. We also developed an emphasis on mindfulness and self-care. As a result, managers are more familiar with how to use faculty and employee assistance program, both for themselves and their employees. Over time, we have seen some of the benefits of a hybrid work environment. Folks feel that Zoom is more democratic and find it easier to speak up or speak up and chat. Workplace microaggressions and conflict are down. And the flexible workspace in geographic and in schedule has led to increased satisfaction with work-life balance that employees strongly value. So while libraries and higher ed in general have been bracing for that great wave of retirements, the pandemic has accelerated shifts in what we all value the most. And one of the things that's risen to the top, of course, is that work-life balance. The great retirement now is more of a reality than ever. Moreover, competition for that remaining talent is growing and hiring and retaining talent is becoming more and more difficult. During the pandemic, as folks have had access to hybrid and fully remote work, there and while there are still equity questions and challenges for this um, around for employers, it's clear that that flexible work environment is something that is increasingly seen as an important benefit and it's it's not going to go away um, and it shouldn't as Carla mentioned it's something that we're seeing benefits of for the organization as well so in conclusion we'd like to share some of the lessons um, in a very brief way that we've learned and try to encapsulate those and the opportunities we've identified over the past couple of years Everything is evolving and will continue to evolve. COVID-19 threw an incredible amount of change at us, and while that might be slowing down, change is inevitable. Our infrastructure is not ideal, and you know what? It never will be. And while we've proven in the worst of circumstances that we can manage change, it's really hard work. And while we've seen that we can change, we know it's easy, because we've seen this happen, to settle back into old patterns. However, if the past two years have shown us anything, it's allowed us to become more flexible and adaptable. And it's shown us that this is something that we can lean into. While our infrastructure we know will never be perfect, we can work on improving it and every bit of improvement is gonna matter. And we've learned that we can collaborate and work across silos. And when we do this, we accomplish great and sometimes things that we thought were impossible. And because we've spent two plus years doing things differently, we know we can, and we know we need to resist settling back into the before time ways. So thank you. And Carla and I hope that some of this framework will be useful and helpful and applicable to others. Thank you very much, Mira and Carla for sharing your experiences in that very useful framework. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers for uh, keeping to time and for your very interesting presentations. Could we have a round of applause for all of our presenters, please? So we do have a few minutes for questions, if we have questions. The colleagues from Botswana, 
it was an interesting uh, presentation and it seems like the the covid uh, pandemics had led to a big change in your library and you said that you became important in the disaster management uh, strategy and i understood that not only about uh, information delivery but also supporting users uh, personal development and social support reducing uh, fear anxiety and so on so what has this done with the position of the library in the university after the pandemic? Thank you very much for the question. It has created big visibility, big acknowledgement and appreciation from our colleagues. And it has really affirmed us and has motivated the team. So we really know we are a strong team and we are actually recognized even beyond just the institution because we are a public university. We serve not just our users here. During the pandemic, we went beyond our, our boundaries. So yes, it has done a lot of visibility for us, especially in the open access uh, environment. We are doing very well. We have brought in new partners. So it has brought in, COVID has brought positive uh, results for us. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for being an attentive audience. We um, are heading into a 15 minute break now and we'll be back at 3.30 for the next session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.